Okay, ladies and gentlemen, as far as I understand, the language of our communication is English, right? No? No. <laughs> Russian? Yes. 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 English. English. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about strange processes and the reality that is changing every day because uh, we actually cannot take all those processes into account. Um, when we talk about cities, when we talk about human settlements, well, we always have to think about uh, the future and the past, because you cannot actually devise the past a settlement should go until you understand the present. And present is always interconnected with the years that passed away and years that are still coming. Still to come. Uh, I'm not an architect. I'm not a designer. I'm a psychologist. And I've been into that field for over 20 years. And besides that, I love my city. And I know its history. And sometimes I have strange views on where it should go. So today we're going to talk about the past a little bit, about the present, and a little bit about the future. Feel absolutely free to ask your questions. Uh, it's good to interfere. It's good to ask questions. So uh, it will be no harm if you just raise your hand this or start asking from your place anything you want. Second, due to my professional views being a psychologist, I'm more focused upon humans. Not the buildings, not the landscape, but humans. How do they interact within the city? And my professional view is that not the landscape defines the future of the city, but people who develop it, people who live in it, and people who show their demands, people who actually say what they want from this place. So we're going to talk about people. You know, Vladivostok is a rather young city. It's not even 200 years. And its history was, as to me, it was actually tragic. Because every 40 or 50 years is changing its course and going to some other direction and starting doing something else. So right now we are summit center and some sort of social activity, global social activity goes on here. And 30 years, what was it? Well, yep, it was a naval base. And my grandfather came here in 1944 as a counterintelligence officer and his task was to make it even more closed. Just 30 years passed and we are on the intercourse choosing the future of the city one more time. So, today we're going to talk mostly about future. But facts, the future is based, can be found in the past. By the way, look at this wonderful picture. 150 years past. Oh, well, you cannot see the ships right here. It's, oh, you can see them there, right? No, no. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, should I kick it? It used to work in Russia for centuries. Anyway. I graduated from the Maritime Academy. Actually, I'm a merchant, marine, engineer, and psychologist, to be correct. And my life was about ships for a long time, too, so I love it. Uh, past is always coming to the present. It's always here. We just have to look really close. So, about the past. Every human settlement has a reason for its founding and the destiny. Sometimes the reason is I was just moving through, I enjoyed that place and I stayed here with my family. And that was good enough for many European cities, many American cities, or for example, they found gold here. That's a great place, let's make a town right here. I used to live in a small town in the US, which was founded just due to logging process. They had some good wood there. And they decided, okay, let's cut it off. And they started cutting the trees, and that's how the town of Cedarwoola came into being. And our neighbors, they just decided, oh, well, we can grow flowers here. They started growing flowers now there, the center of tulip producing in the U.S. A reason is always simple, and you should not look deep into it. So, the reason for Vladivostok Foundation was very simple. 
but it's not evident to most people. It's mostly global control. Originally, Russia was streamlined into America. And for many years, do you know the history about Russian-American company? Okay, Alaska was ours, right? You remember that. Besides that, California and Oregon was ours. Did you know about that? And locals in California had some good relations with Russians. We had several settlements there. We should have been in Miami right now. But it was far. And it was hard to communicate with the mainland. And the main reason for our mm, leaving the American continent was due to communication lines. Wooden ships, you know. The British built a huge fleet and they could do that. We couldn't. We're not really a seafaring nation, Scotches. And all of the colonization process for Russia was continental. It was streamlined for that, just going all the way over the hills. Oh, gosh, the sea. What should we do? I don't know. Probably we should build some ships, maybe. So that's what they did. They started going to America and found out that they didn't have enough ships. And by 1850s, uh, most of the Russian uh, regional governors knew America was lost. We could not maintain it. But suddenly, we found out that Asia was already taken by the British. We came way too late. And Singapore was British. Wonderful places in Vietnam were French. British, French, Germans. And we had to do something. Because we were really coming close to a moment when our line to America would have been interrupted. So that's when this guy right here, Nikolai Nikolaevich Morbiev from Ursky, decided it was the time to start going Asia. Actually, Russia was going the Asian way in the 18th century, in the early 19th, but we're going to the Middle East. We were going into Afghanistan and India. We wanted to communicate with those lands. But Far East was something really wild. And you know, when I've been reading books about 1890s, how do you think, what was the biggest fear of the citizens of Vladivostok in 1890s? What did they fear? No, nope. They used to live with the Chinese. And mostly, um, the real secret is, there were not so many Chinese here. They came later. The tigers! Oh. Actually, people were eaten by the tigers. When I used to read a wonderful book by uh, Mr. Snyder, he was the German in origin, but traveled to the Russian Far East and stayed here for several years. He was a journalist. Then he went to Korea and came back. So Mr. Snyder wrote that when they were traveling outside the city, they were traveling with their guns out, waiting for the tigers to start jumping out and eating them. And that was a fact. Because those cats just didn't know that they shouldn't attack human beings. They thought humans were good, nice food in good package. They could eat you any moment. So, when this guy decided to stop moving America and start moving Asia, they found out that the land was already taken. And they had to make the final move, the final Russian continental leap, in order to take at least anything. That's what they did. So, he ordered this guy, Gennady Ivan Shtevetskoy, my academy was named after him. He was actually a godlike person for me when I was a cadet. He was the guy who disobeyed the official order. And that person was the prime ruler of the Eastern Siberia. But of course, he was responsible for the Tsar, and he had to answer to, what are you doing there, Nikolai Nikolaevich? And he said, oh, nothing, I'm just sending Gennady Ivan Shtevetskoy to go to Sakhalin. But the orders were not to disturb the Chinese. And that guy, unofficially, in top secret mode, gave an instruction to this guy to go to, to explore Amur River. Because we were actually not sure 
if it was possible to pass. Oh, so do you have a view of the Asia map in your mind? You can, you know where Sahalin is, right? Of course, you're designers and architects. You should know where Sahalin is. So we were thinking that there was no strait between Sahalin and the mainland. For the land was unexplored, and we didn't know that there was no land bridge to Sakhalin. On some maps it was there, on some maps it wasn't. And so we needed that strait. So it, it would mean that Sakhalin protects the mainland from the ocean. And that land was good for taking. And that land was good for naval bases. And so he told him, Okay, Gennady you Ivanovich, know, we'll probably shoot you. But you should go and check if there is a normal way between Sakhalin and the main shore. So that's what he did. He was a rebel, you know, and besides just checking for Sakhalin, he founded a city called Nikolaevsk. Just an outpost by those times. He raised the Russian flag, and then he went on. Uh, now we know that period as Amur expeditions, but actually those times it was Mednevelskoy running all the way around Sakhalin and Amur region. And he founded a new city, an outpost, just telling everybody, Russians came here. It's, it's way north from here. Now it's a very small town, and it's in the past. I regret that, but that's true. So, he said we can take this land. And then, Moscow, but actually, Nikolai Nikolaevich, made it so these two guys started the diplomatic process. Uh, these names are actually the legends in the Far East. Efimi Vasilievich Putyatin was an admiral and a diplomat. It was that way in Russia, so if you wanted a good state career, you shouldn't go into civilian career, actually. You should go into military. You should go into the Navy if you want some sort of noble career, and going all the way, exploring everything. If you wanted to become a governor of some area, you should go into the army. That was a tradition. So. You see FLS and all of them, but that doesn't mean they were actually straight-line military guys. They were mostly diplomats. And so Yefimi Vasilievich went to Japan and negotiated that we start trade with Japan. And then he went to China and negotiated that this land is a place of interest for us. And a bit later, Nikolai Pavlovich Ignatyev, I think you should read it yourself. We don't have time for that. But his story is a James Bond story of the 1860s. He's actually the guy who persuaded the Chinese that bad European world is going to kill you all. <laughs> and when the Europeans came, he was telling the Chinese, I've been telling you that all the time. They're going to cut your heads off. So the Chinese were so influenced, let's say so, by him, that they signed a treaty that Russia protects China from Europe and for that you can take that useless piece of land you call Vladivostok, they call the Bay of the Trepang, that small crawling thing out there. So you should data mine these people. They were gorgeous. But that was the city in 1866-1870. Some small ships, some small buildings, and mostly cannons. That's what they brought here. Not European civilization, of course, they brought cannons. You know why? Because the British were coming. And the next year, after Vladivostok was founded in 1860, actually the British squadron came into the bay raised their flags and decided to start colonization. Then they saw Russians and cannons. Oh shoot, said the British Admiral. Ah, oh, Russians. So they turned out and went back to Singapore or Hong Kong, I don't know where. 
The whole story of Vladivostok is devoted to grabbing the land and not giving it to anybody. But that was the last land grab of Russian Empire that was so successful. But to tell the truth, it didn't only bring the new beginning. It actually brought death. Death to four Russian cities. First of all, it killed Kyakhta. Have you ever heard about Kyakhta? No. Kyakhta was the major trade center between Russia and China. The amount of trade from Kyakhta was accounted into billions of golden rubles. We were the main source for tea coming from the mainland. Of course, the Brits had the uh, clipper fleet that were very fast. And as partially a naval officer, I admire their ships. They were beautiful. They were bringing tea from the east to Europe. But actually, Kyakhta was the place where most of the tea used to go through. Uh, Transbaikal region. On the very border, if you imagine you're Lake Baikal and divide the line, just going this way a little bit further, Kyakha was there. On the border was China. And in Russia it was known as Kyakhtinskaya Yarmarka, the Kyakha Fair. Uh, the very moment when Vostok was founded, it became a trade center. And Kyakhta trade started to decline, and finally it killed the huge trade center in the Russian Transbaikal region. That was the first victim of Vladivostok. <coughs> Second one was much closer to us, Nikolaevsk, a prominent settlement with good future, was doomed to be an original small settlement. Five years after Vladivostok was founded, people from Nikolaevsk moved to Vladivostok. Well, as a matter of fact, people here knew their profit. They wanted to do trades, to do uh, hunting for resources, to do mining, and when they found out that Nikolaevsk was not the epicenter of the activity, of course they moved to Vladivostok. What this lesson teaches us, it actually tells us that no city is guaranteed a bright future. Even now, when we're talking about Vladivostok, say, oh, wonderful geopolitical place, nice climate, we'll lie to ourselves, of course. Oh, nice climate, okay. We're well, actually not seeing the future, because <laughs> tomorrow something might happen. And so early years ago, we had a fear that Chinese are going to build a huge seaport. Remember at the Tumanne River, we're fearing for the port there. What would it mean? For us, for Vladivostok, it would mean death. For Port Vostochny, it would mean decline and death. So that's where politics interfered. And a trade center on the very border, especially with North Korea, was something not really stable and not really... It was not responsible city building. So, uh, sometimes I'm fearing that what's happening in North Korea is actually working for Vladivostok very good. Because everybody is scared of that region. And we're saying, okay, it's almost safe here. Of course, we're scared too. But still, uh, we know that, okay, we can do trade here. And everybody is scared of that. So, Nikolaevsk was the second victim of Vladivostok. It declined, and finally it became just, just a small settlement. Third one was actually Ahotsk. You know Ahotsk. You know what's so important about Ahotsk? It still doesn't have a normal mainland road to it. Because nobody needed it, actually. It was uh, founded in the 18th century. It was the major seaport for Russia, but, well, they located Vladivostok. Who needed a Hotsk anymore? And all the official um, structures like maritime school, and finally became the academy that I graduated from, 
uh, and all the official departments moved from Ahotsk to Vladivostok. They never built a decent road to Ahotsk from that time. So it's still supplied mainly by the sea. They have a couple of airports, but sea is the only route to there. And Vladivostok killed the bright future of Ahotsk. But the last one I'm absolutely sure you've never heard of. Have you ever heard the name of Koshka? No. You heard about Koshka, right? In the Olga Bay. Right? What's Olga? Uh, Olga. Ah. Uh, Olga. Okay. Koshka Bay was a small um, harbor, very good for trade. And trade was going there for centuries. Some say that even since the Baha'i Empire, uh, kingdom. Uh, since the 9th century, it was going there. It was a trade center. And in the 19th century, lots of ships were coming there to trade with the locals. But then Vladivostok was founded. And centuries of trade, they diminished and came into nothing. And now the trade moved here. So Vladivostok was actually the killer of the smaller cities due to its geopolitical situation and due to its geographical position. And I think that guy knew about that. So that's how a plant, a plant formed in the middle of the of 19th century actually came into being only now. Because, you know, when the military comes, actually everybody else goes up. So, originally, Vladivostok was planned as a naval station and a naval base. Due to its wonderful uh, landscape and due to its protection from the sea. And as a matter of fact, it served as a naval base not really effectively. You know why? Because enemies never really came here. It has been attacked <coughs> only once, well, no, twice. First time by the Chinese rebels in uh, 1870s, but they never came here. And second time by the uh, Japanese squadron in 1905. They shelled it a little bit. Uh, local stock was a sort of salute. Then some people were killed, then our squadron went out, the Japanese went away. That was the Russian Japanese war. That's it. We've never seen the Japanese battleships until the 1980s, when they came off the visit. And yeah, there is a story about kamikaze pilot that attacked the oil station. Uh, my grandfather was a counterintelligence officer here of a very high rank by those times. And he told me that actually that was a poor Japanese pilot who lost his horse. He saw the city, and then that city killed him. It was not a kamikaze, actually. It was just a stray pilot who didn't find his horse and got lost. So actually, it has been a passive naval base in terms of actual battle. <clears throat> but that reality, well, it took almost a century for us. And take a look at it. It's, it's a really wonderful harbor with lots of secondary harbors, with a good perspective. That's why Vladivostok became the city. But. In the 1860s, they still didn't know if they want to stay here or go to Pasiet. The Pasiet area was much warmer. It's not far from here, it's the um, southern part of the Primorsky region. And they almost moved the capital to that place. Pasiet could have been the capital of the Russian army station. But the military said, no, we cannot protect it. It's way too flat here. We need hills to place artillery there. That's why Vladivostok finally became what it is now. In a very simplified fashion. But up 
up to you, grab the land. You need to do something with it. You need to hold it. You need to fill it with some activity. Because just the base is dead there. First of all, uh, let's go into some economic planning. Try to imagine yourselves as a military commander of the outpost of Vladivostok. And Navy is stationed here. What do you need? Think, what do you need? Oh, they're coming and leaving. Thank you. Uh, actually, you need supplies. And lots of them. You need food to give it to the sailors. What else? Think. Oh, armaments, no, they were produced back in, uh, in the central Russia. What? Housing. Housing, yes, you need housing for them, because try to imagine those guys were out in the sea for months, they're just moving like that way, they want some place where they can stay and have some rest. Actually, Yes, you need fuel, <coughs> you need repairs, you need... Uh, and in the means of the uh, 19th century, you need wood and coal. They found a piece of coal in one of the small local Manjurian houses here. And they decided, well, there is some coal somewhere around. They started looking for it frantically, and they found it. First near Kavichanka, then the Suchan mines. And they said, okay, we have coal, we have lots of wood around. That's a perfect base. So that's why they stay here. But military doesn't mean cities. Military doesn't mean settlements. Military means just land control. And the next year after the city was founded, a first civilian person arrived with his family. It was the state politics, because you needed ordinary people there, somebody who could cut wood, produce coal, and grow some food. And people started coming here, slowly. Now, try to imagine, you're living somewhere in, uh, somewhere in Ukraine, for example, and it's warm there, and everything is growing well. Why should you raise your ass and go to some god-forgotten place somewhere there? The map is not big enough to show where you have to go. So first, people who came here were adventurers. Actually, bloodthirsty bastards who wanted money and fame. They came here just to take this area, exploit it, and become rich. First settlers were not such romantic, nice people going somewhere where the sun goes out and just taking the land. They were actually not really good people, let's say that way. And when they came here, they found out that they went to the right place, because locals were not really happy seeing them. And there were bandits attacking settlements. There were some really dark pages in the history when settlers were actually moving people from their land. And there were people here, of course. And so that was a very forgotten period of Vladivostok development. Nobody actually knows how many people died here, and nobody actually knows how uh, many locals were moved back to Manjuria, China, or Korea. What year? Uh, 1860, 1866. That period is largely Mm, uncharted. When the official process of mm, settlement started later in 1880s, uh, it was on the state level. You know, they made special maps for the settlers. They started looking for places where new villages and settlements could be founded. But that was later. In 1860s, it was just the same way the Wild West was taken by the Americans from the Indians. And that's not a really 
nice part of our institution. But anyway, Vladivostok had nothing to do with that, of course. They had civilized people here, mostly. And that was the time when it started growing. Just think about it. 1860, it's like a couple of platoons of the military guys. 1861, one civilian and his family. 1878, 4,000 presidents. <coughs> Not the military guys coming in and out. That's residents. Most of the people from Nikolaevsk and the area that moved here, but many of them coming from the main Russia. And Vladivostok became the... When I used to study in U.S., they told me a lot about the melting pot theory. Well, it was going on here the same way. Plus, we had people coming from other lands. We had a lot of Koreans coming here. Thousands, tens of thousands. And the Chinese suddenly understood they lost something. And they started pouring into the region. Uh, mostly poor people coming here to find their fortune. So the area was actually the land of energy for some time. Until the administration was established, the civilian administration, not the military administration. And by 1880s, actually Vladivostok was the place controlled uh, by civilization, and several other small settlements were also the centers of civilization in that area. Yeah, and we officially became the city. Uh, take a look at the coat of arms. Actually, well, I love it. It still reminds us about being a fortress. It was a fortress at that time. But what happened next? You see that line there? That's the very end of the city. Actually, the only street going all the way from the... Uh, uh, no, from Fyodorov Bay. Actually, that's that line here, going all the way through here, the area uh, known as Bugavaya right now. Well, not reaching it actually, it's not going here, it's just staying there. It's just a single street. And when you read books by the first founders of the city, they actually didn't build that street as a street. They just cut the trees. And stumps remained in the ground. Because they didn't have enough manpower to take them out first. They just cut the trees, used the wood for building first houses, and left the line of these stumps all the way from here to Mugabai. <laughs> they didn't have enough manpower to do that. And then the stumps rotted away, and another reason was, try to imagine, trees were like that, and they had to cut it, and now they had to take it out. So, huge holes in the ground from Fyodorovska Bay to Lugavaya. This wouldn't have been a nice view. So they left the remains of the trees in the ground. They didn't have enough manpower. But, five years later, after official program of moving people from Central Russia and Ukraine to Vladivostok, unwinded and started sending here thousands of people every month. It brought the Vladivostok to, the, uh, to that extent where the city doesn't just die out. Oh, just a small fact. There were serious problems with uh, medicine here. And illnesses like flu were a constant event. And lots of people were dying without actually any medicine. So they had to pour more and more people into the area for them to survive. Bringing new diseases, causing new serious outbreaks of different illnesses. And the city was on the brink of either dying out or developing further. And only moving people here from the west brought it on that development line. They supplied it with people. That's how it actually worked in the 1860s, 1870s. But later, well, here you have nice pictures. 
They are mostly of the 1902-1909, they are later. But by 1878, that's a plan by 1896. I'll show you later a plan of 1870s. I have it with me, the original. And they actually didn't move any further than that line. They had no enough manpower. And only with a serious civilian injection uh, into that city, it started development. People. Just pouring people into the city. There were no other way. Uh, they were enforced to come here. Um, Ex-criminals, uh, mostly political criminals to be correct, not uh, some killers or just something like that, no, political criminals. Uh, many mm, people from Poland came to Vladivostok after they were sentenced to prison in Siberia. And when uh, that term ended, like they were sentenced to five or ten years to Siberia, after the outbreak of the... There was a rebellion in Warsaw, in Poland, in the middle of the 19th century. And Poland was a part of Russia by that time. <coughs> and many young people, students of the Warsaw University, were actually given a choice to go to the military or to go to Siberia. And they chose to go to Siberia. Most of them uh, spent five years as soldiers in, in Eastern Siberia, and then they were given the option. You cannot come back to Poland, they were told, but you can settle here. And so they were allowed, allowed to settle here. That's why there are so many uh, Polish-like last names in the Russian Far East. There were a lot of guys from Poland here. It was, it was a very rebellious spirit. And so, uh, when the military came on the second line and not started not to play the major role in the city, the civilians started to develop it. And what do civilians want? Do they want fortresses? Well, to some extent, yes, they want to feel some protection. But actually, try to imagine right now, what do you want from the city? You want some culture, you want shops, you want, oh yeah, theaters, I said culture, uh, you want some normal streets, nice houses, uh, you want some clean water at least. And that's how the city started developing, by the civilians. But where could they take the technology, where could they take uh, the supplies? from the military. And that's how it started working. Military engineers started building the communications, mostly naval engineers. Uh, military supplies were given to people. Lots of food was being supplied to the naval base uh, by ships, of course. And when people didn't have enough food, they could go to the military and ask for that, and it was given to them. There are several documents saying that was an, there was an official order to supply the civilians. And so that's where the first, actually, well, you cannot actually call them businessmen. I think I should call them adventurers. Came to the area and started developing the business <laughs> here. One of them, you can handle Georgi Romanovich. But actually, uh, he's German. He was he was an architect who used he participated in constructing the Berlin Cathedral. And he came to the Russian Far East to start his own business. <coughs> and he was the founder of the first independent architectural company in Vladivostok. And he was a successful guy. You know, he built a lot of a lot of a lot of buildings. Most of them didn't survive to our days. But you know St. Paul's St. Paul's Church? And he 
was the architect who designed it, and it was his job to oversee the construction. And there are still several buildings from that period. Uh, for what he did here, he received Russian imperial citizenship, and he became... Um, it's a long story to tell you what was the social structure of the Russian Empire. But actually, um, for some time, it was not really good to go into business. It was not a very decent thing to do. You should have been a military guy or somebody close to the Tsar. But later, uh, traders became <coughs> the backbone of the state. And they, in Russian, they were known as Kupets. And there was a special system for them with ranks. And you could progress through this system and going higher and higher and higher, being a Kupets of the first rank was like being a general. And for his work here in Vladivostok, he received the rank of the trader, uh, uh, he was the trader of the second rank. Uh, when the Soviets came, he was old enough, but he traveled to China, then he traveled further on, and he died in 1947. Very old and a respected, a respected person. Uh, the same thing here with Alexander Gvozdievsky. Uh, he was actually Gvozdievsky. Not Gvozdievsky, as is being called sometimes in official documents. He was appointed the chief architect of the Primorsky Oblast. Uh, Oblast is not a region like Primorsky Krai right now. It was starting on the very north, and from the north, from the northern sea, going all the way to here. That huge area was called the Primorsky Oblast. It was a single uh, territorial, uh, I don't know how to say that. That was a region of Russia, a single region of Russia. And that guy was uh, appointed to be the chief architect, but actually he had no means to control all that land. It was really huge. And he concentrated uh, all he could do on Vladivostok. And why we value that guy? Uh, he built the first, he constructed the first original Vostochny Institute building. Uh, put it there. Uh, that stands until now. So he was actually the guy who uh, made the project of that building and oversee the construction. Oversaw the construction. Uh, we know few names of that period mostly due to a very short term of stay here. People used to come here, try something, and go on. But these two names, well, we know them for sure. So Vladivostok started developing, uh, giving some social services, raising the quality of life. And that's where a big amount of people all over Russia decided, well, it's a good idea to move here. After the buildings were constructed, after the roads were planted, they decided, yeah, it's time to start moving here. <coughs> and actually, the future path of the city started right there in 1909-1910. But actually, what used to happen to the city? It started as a military outpost and the naval station. Then it became the colonization center for the region. Then for a short period of time, it became a regional capital and the port of Franco, a free trade seaport. That's where it all started. Then, they said, okay, we're building a fortress here. And the development stopped a little bit. Then, First World War came. And Vladivostok became the key transportation hub uh, for the supplies coming from America and go into the front of the First World War. We usually know about Second World War and the land lease process, but we don't know how many goods were brought through Vladivostok in the First World War. 
not Murmansk, not Arkhangelsk, but Vladivostok became the key transportation hub for the Russian First World War. Then, it was the last rebellious land of the Russian Empire. Actually, we could boast that we were the last capital of the Russian Empire. Because um, since 1920 until 1922, that was the place where the uh, remaining uh, governing body of the Russian Empire actually was. Uh, then, things started to happen really fast. And I have to stop a little bit on that. Usually, you can find a lot of material on what was happening here in the 1860s, 1890s, 1910, but 1925 to 1935 was a very interesting period because uh, famous architect came here from Moscow. Beautiful plans were devised for developing the city with lots of parks, with lots of infrastructure, but mainly with a huge naval base. And that was the key element for the development. And what the military needs? Supplies and food. So, um, lots of industrial centers were created in that period. Lots of mining. Uh, by the way, in the 19, uh, in 1919, uh, one of the uh, descendants of the Brunner family uh, talked to Dzerzhinsky, that was the head of the uh, Russian secret police by that time, and he suggested to create a first Soviet like, capitalist enterprise, the mines in the Far East. Uh, I think they were, uh, they were mining lead. You know lead, right? Sweet. So, uh, they started mining lots of it, and then prices fell down, and first Russian capitalist enterprise lose it. But at that period, in 1925-1935, they built uh, a huge mining complex there. And every six bullets in the World War II was made of the materials mined here. So, we actually don't know how many processes used to go here. Uh, not many documents are researched right now. You can go do that yourself. That is the most undervalued period in the Russian Far East history, actually, as I think. But, Vladivostok starts moving to becoming a closed city. Then the war started, and at that period there were, there were a lot of terrible events happening here, trust me. If you go deep into history, we'll have no time to talk about it. But then the war started, and why they needed it? Of course, as a transportation hub. Most people don't know, but Vladivostok poured through itself four times more goods and military machinery and guns than Arkhangelsk did five times more than Murmansk did. That was the key center for transportation of the American goods into Russia. Um, mostly forgotten by now. But when something really terrible in the world scale starts happening, just take a look here. Key Pacific Transportation Hub 1914, Transportation hub, the biggest transportation hub in the world at that period, 1942-1945. When something bad starts, happen, starts happening, we become a transportation hub. Then, uh, in 1951, there was a secret order um, by the uh, Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union about the situation of the 5th fleet. That's how the Russian Pacific fleet was called at the time. And they said that they needed some 
completely secret base for it. Nobody took any civilian uh, request into consideration, and Vladivostok started the process of being a locked city. It was locked forever. You could not come into it without special permission. You even, um, when first satellite imagery of Vladivostok came to the West, and Russian intelligence intercepted those images, there was a special process installed in the city of camouflaging what was going on here. Every civilian person was actually a little bit military in the 50s and in the early 60s, because the city was living by the military laws. Few foreigners entered it in that period. Actually, my parents and I, we remember that time as a good time. The city was clean, only familiar faces, good police, almost no crime, and it was good to be in the military. But actually, it was not really a city. It was a huge naval base. And social services were, well, they were not limited. But they were rather primitive at that time. You want theaters? Okay, here is the military theater, and here is a classical theater. Okay, let's do a special theater for little kids. Yeah, that's that's. Somebody wants to come here from other country? No. Um, you want to see some foreign goods? No. You have good our goods. We have to eat that. Nice feeling. I knew. But everything was a rather clumsy and most of the buildings were in a poor shape and falling apart. And that's when Khrushchev came to Vladivostok in 1954 for the first time. He looked at it and said, well, it's a wonderful place. It has a great landscape. And very bad buildings and terrible roads. I think I should shoot somebody. Well, probably he didn't say that, but... Um, Probably he did, I don't know. Grandfather never told me about his first name. But actually Vladivostok started the renovation. Lots of new houses, lots of new roads, uh, lots of restoration processes on the old buildings. Uh, not just painting them, but actually caring for them. And what you see now in Vladivostok is mainly known due to Khrushchev's decision to save it. And he came back in 1960. Um, many, many officials suffered terribly from his second visit because it was not fast enough. And he wanted new roads fast. But actually, these two visits were the key to renovating Vladivostok. And then, nothing actually changed since 1960. 1991. The infrastructure <laughs> was slowly declining. The amount of people being here was almost stable. No new people coming in, no people coming out. And it was a stagnation period for the city. That's where something had to be done. And then Soviet Union went into the past. Yo. Some people say those were terrible times. I remember them. I enjoyed them a lot. There was no law. Um, small local businesses were being blown out every day. Well, actually, they were blown because bad guys were harassing businessmen, taking money from them, and blowing out their, just destroying their shops the houses. It was a terrible time. It was shooting on the street section. Most of us do not remember it, but I was a little bit involved into that. I was going in for boxing, and we were actually nice times. Lots of smuggling was done. Lots of <laughs> smuggling. You cannot imagine, actually, the real size of trade and smuggling going on through Vladivostok at that period of time. 
for example, one of my colleagues wanted to bring in uh, five ships of Chinese shoes into Vladivostok, made out of leather, but he didn't want to pay anything, no taxes for that. And so he said they were the construction shoes for the workers, <laughs> the low-grade ones. And he paid like uh, 10 cents instead of two dollars for one pair. And actually he said there were just 10,000 10, of shoes, while there were like half a million of them. Nobody actually asked how many of, how many of them do you have there. Five ships came into the city, they unloaded the shoes, and they went to Moscow. It was a wonderful time. No law at all. But the city was declining. Because nobody wanted to invest into it. And everything was going down and down and down. So, right now we are in a very interesting period. In a very interesting period. Because that's why we're heaven is over. And Vladivostok now has to choose what to do. It has to choose its activity. It has to choose its destiny, its path right now. <coughs> and I have no time to tell you about that, but actually that's a master plan from the 1924. And you cannot see it here. Uh, the red areas are actually areas that were really developed. And right here, for example, that area was uh, considered to be very prospective. But it's not. Nobody knows the real path the city will take. That's it. So that's it. No time for that map. Later I'll, I'll tell you a little bit. So what are the facts <laughs> you have to know uh, when you are planning something in Vladivostok? First of all, that's the real official thing. Um, the Primorsky region is declining slowly in population. But, you see, its general population is still declining. Not as bad as oh, the 90s, yeah, okay. the good times. Uh, not as bad as at that time, but it's still declining right now. At the same time, the rural population is on the declining line, and urban population is on the rather stable line, and it's actually <laughs> been fueled by the guys from the ladies, from the rural areas. So cities are mostly